Janessa, a brand new true crime podcast from the BBC World Service and CBC Podcasts. It's a story about love, deceit and survival, and it's available now. Find out more at the end of this podcast. Welcome to The Inquiry. I'm Charmaine Cozier. Each week, four expert witnesses, one question and an answer. Twenty twenty three, it's New Year's Day in Afghanistan. Just before eight AM, a bomb explodes by the gates of a military airport in the capital, Kabul. The location is protected with concrete barriers and barbed wire fences, but some personnel are trapped outside at a checkpoint. Official numbers aren't released, but it's later confirmed that several people were killed or injured. It's the latest in a series of extreme militant attacks, which have intensified since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan in 2021. Before that happened, the group led a deadly insurgency. Now, it's trying to crush one. So this week we're asking, can the Taliban fix its terror problem? Part one, the return to power. The Taliban is a hardline Islamist fundamentalist group that first arose to power in Afghanistan in 1996 and ruled for five years. Dr. Madia Afsal is a fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution based in Washington, D.C. It arose to power at that point after the vacuum that was left after the Soviet-Afghan war of the 1980s. And it essentially imposed a very repressive and regressive interpretation of Sharia law in the country, you know, shutting off women from education, the right to work, and so on. It also banned television, cinema and music. The Taliban's strict laws and severe punishments raised human rights concerns and were widely condemned. At that point, it was, you know, a country and a group that was internationally isolated, but it did have three countries that gave it international recognition. Those were Pakistan, its neighbor, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Then in October 2001, just weeks after the 9-11 terrorist attacks in America, US-led forces invaded Afghanistan. The group responsible, al-Qaeda, were based there and the Taliban was accused of providing a sanctuary for them. Within weeks, the Taliban regime had been toppled. They were eventually replaced by a series of US-backed progressive governments. So, in particular, you had girls attending school, high school, going to university, working, enjoying essentially freedom and rights. The Taliban hadn't gone away completely. It regrouped and launched a rebellion. It was a violent insurgency that attacked US forces, that attacked NATO forces, that attacked those elements of the Afghan regime. It was an effort to drive the US and NATO forces out of Afghanistan and to take over power again. That was the goal of the insurgency. Then in February 2020, 19 years after the war started, the Taliban made a surprise move. They shared a global stage with a superpower. It signed a controversial agreement with President Trump's administration in Doha, Qatar. The third party, you know, the Afghan government at the time was not party to that deal, which was, you know, flawed to begin with. And essentially, the U.S. promised a timetable saying that it would withdraw by May of 2021, basically a 15 month timetable for very little in Taliban promises. The Taliban commitments were vague, prevent Afghanistan being used as a base for terror groups to attack the US or its allies, and also start peace talks with the Afghan government. The Taliban got everything that they wanted. And then the Biden administration came into power and after a review, essentially kept to the deal signed by the Trump administration, you know, in April of 2021, announcing that by the end of August, it would withdraw. That date confirmation emboldened the Taliban. It took just 10 days to sweep across the country and seize the capital on the 15th of August, 2021. 
The Taliban's return to power was swift, and so was the reversal of a policy that had led many to believe things would be different this time round. We also saw a promise that girls' secondary schools would be reopened in March, so about six months after the Taliban came into power. But that decision was reneged on the day it was supposed to take place. The chain of command shed some light on the Taliban's backtracking. The Kabul-based leaders behind the broken promises take their orders from the group's hardline religious leadership based hundreds of kilometres away in Kandahar. So while those who are in Kabul are able to engage with the world in a way that may have been different from the Taliban of 96 to 2001, that really has not made any tangible difference in the way Afghanistan is governed because all the rulings come from Kandahar. Once again, the ruling Taliban is attracting international condemnation. It is important to note that no countries at this point recognize the Taliban regime as a legitimate government. So not even Pakistan, which had the first time around been a supporter of the Taliban. It's clear that there is very little sympathy that they're receiving from the rest of the world at this point. Decades of progressive measures have been reversed. Females are now also banned from primary and higher education. Women have been sidelined from the workplace. Women have been cut off from going to public parks and gymnasiums. You know, men now also have to wear beards. There's also been increasing repression in terms of the kind of punishments that the Taliban are imposing, very much like the time that they were in power in 96 to 2001, including public whippings for both women and men. And they just undertook their first public execution as well. To discover the impact of Taliban rule on daily life, let's hear from our next expert witness. Part two, a bird with one wing. They are not governing. They don't have enough knowledge from management to science. They only know the religious stuff. I'm Roya Musavi. I'm a journalist and human rights activist. I've worked in Afghanistan for many years. Recently, before moving and fleeing the country, I used to be a spokesperson for International Committee of the Red Cross in Afghanistan. I left Afghanistan one week after the Taliban took over. And until the day that I left, I couldn't sleep because I had fear that now I will be targeted, now I will be killed because I was in the media and I criticized many times their behaviors against humans' rights. Their... The situation was very frightening and it was, for me personally, I couldn't continue under the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. That's why I had no other option except leaving. Afghanistan is still reeling from the after-effects of a decades-long war and the fallout from its sudden end. It's also seen extreme drought, severe food shortages and mass displacement during the harsh winter months. The humanitarian situation in Afghanistan is dire and catastrophic. The poverty is increasing. There is a huge amount of hunger. People don't have enough food to eat. They cannot survive. Child labor is in the big cities and the rural areas. It's a big problem. Also, the humanitarian situation in terms of women's participation, gender equality, access to justice. According to figures from the United Nations, Afghanistan's economy lost $5 billion since the Taliban took over in August 2021. Everyday life for the people in Afghanistan has been totally changed from individual freedoms to economic aspect, everything has been disrupted because the Taliban, they are de facto authorities. The UN also estimates the economic cost of excluding women from the workforce to be $1 billion a year. And the long-term impact is a new wave of immigration because people, they don't have any other options except leaving the country. One wing of the society is paralyzed by the Taliban. 
a bird cannot fly only with one wing. Everyone is suffering currently, but women and children, they are suffering more and more. We cannot say that in the past, Afghanistan was a haven. No, because in the last 20 years, Afghanistan was a male dominated community, but women could participate in different aspects of the society, from political aspect to social, economic, every aspect. There was a very good space for women to participate. But after the Taliban took over, everything has been changed. In December 2022, all local and foreign non-governmental organizations were banned from employing Afghan women. That caused a small number of aid groups, which rely on female staff to deliver humanitarian aid to women and children, to temporarily stop work in the country. Sporadic small-scale public demonstrations led by women are happening, but the Taliban are quick to shut them down. Protesters are detained. People try to stand up against them, but it's very difficult to stand up against the terrorist group. They fought for 20 years and they killed thousands of people in different parts of the country. And people are not armed. They are armed and they can do whatever they want. When the Taliban were previously in power, Roya Musawi was seven years old. And I have remembered that the Taliban were beating women on the streets. For instance, they have beaten my mother right in front of my eyes in our hometown because my mother with a group of women, they went out without male guardians. And they are the same Taliban. The Taliban may be in charge, but it has problems of its own. Part three, the threat from ISK. It is the primary threat that the Taliban face. It's the main opposition, really, to the Taliban's whole Afghanistan. Dr. Asfandi Amir is a senior expert in political violence and South Asia security issues at the US Institute of Peace. So Islamic State K, also known as the Islamic State of the Khorasan province, is the Afghanistan affiliate of the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, referred to as ISIS. Different countries use different names for the group, so instead of ISIS, you might know it as Islamic State or ISIL. In June 2014, it declared the establishment of an Islamic State or Caliphate in Iraq and Syria after seizing significant parts of both countries. But its ambition was not constrained by geographical borders. It was advocating mass casualty attacks against civilians and multiple states wanted to topple the Pakistani government, punish the Iranian regime for being a vanguard of Shias, and also purify Afghanistan by challenging and dislodging the Taliban as the main jihadi movement there, as well as punishing minority groups like the Hazaras, like the Shias, who as per this group have brought impurity to the country. A year later, in 2015, ISK was formed in Afghanistan. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria is the mothership of this organization. So ISIS-K sees its presence in Afghanistan as an extension of the caliphate of Iraq and Syria, which as per ISIS ideology is the supreme political institution and is supposed to determine the political direction for Muslims around the world. ISK and the Taliban are enemies with fundamental differences over ideas and beliefs. ISIS-K subscribes to a particular ideology, which we refer to as Salafism. Sometimes people also call it jihadi Salafism. And it plays up the purity of its anti-idolatry credentials, especially compared to the Taliban. The Taliban, on the other hand, are different. They subscribe to a different Sunni Islamic sectarian school, the Hanafi Madhab, which ISIS-K regards as deficient and a school of thought that needs to be challenged militarily. It's also calling out the Taliban's closeness to other countries. ISIS-K is extremely critical of the Taliban's dealings with the international community in general and with the United States in particular. It is a fierce critic of any time the Taliban engage with the international community, hits them hard in its prolific propaganda output for betraying the cause of Islam, for making a deal with what they call our so-called infidels. And that puts a lot of pressure on the Taliban 
It's difficult to know how big ISK membership is. Estimates range from a couple of thousands to the low tens of thousands. So far, it doesn't appear to be a nationwide movement. Instead, it appears to be localized to select parts of Afghanistan. Much of its activity is in the east of the country, two or three provinces, as well as the capital city of Kabul. ISK has carried out numerous high-profile attacks. They fall into three categories. The first target the Taliban. These have ranged from small hit-and-run attacks to large suicide bombings against Taliban targets. And ISK has conducted these attacks not only inside Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan, where the Taliban and some of its leadership has been based over the past many years. The second type goes after religious minorities and other marginalised groups. And ISIS-K has been absolutely brutal in its attacks. They have attacked maternity wards, they have attacked schools attended by girls from small minority groups like the Hazaras. And then the third type of attacks against the international community so when the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan, ISIS-K hit the Kabul airport, killing multiple U.S. military servicemen and women, as well as a lot of Afghan civilians. Diplomatic locations in Kabul have also been hit by ISK. In September 2022, a suicide bomb exploded at the Russian embassy. A few months later, Pakistan's embassy was targeted by gunfire. It started hitting regions where it had previously not been active and it also started infiltrating inside the Taliban's security cordons which suggested that it had some penetrations in the Taliban's networks which was generating intelligence for it to hit high-value Taliban targets. ISK recruits include ex-Taliban members who feel their former group isn't extreme enough. After initially trying to ignore its existence, the Taliban is now taking ISK much more seriously. They've started making the point that this is a threat that they are worried about. Yet, the Taliban have not been able to target any senior leader of ISIS-K. Shahab al-Muhajir has been in charge for many years now, and the Taliban seem to have no idea where he's at. The Taliban have also struggled to target other high-value leaders of this movement. Part 4. An International Predicament. So the biggest threat the Taliban faces is the broader problem of governing Afghanistan. And one of this is defeating militant groups like ISK, but more broadly, providing services to a population that saw 20 years of a better life. Daniel Byman is a professor at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. His specialisms include counterterrorism. There were huge problems when the US-backed government was in power, and these included corruption, of course, the Civil War. These should not be minimized. But there was also an increase in economic growth in much of the country. So the Taliban has a population that is aware that things could be better, and satisfying those voices will be very difficult, given the Taliban's current governing policies. Constant terror attacks by ISK undermine a crucial policy the Taliban probably thought it would have no trouble implementing, bringing security to the country. There was a time when the Taliban were the insurgents, so to what extent can it use that insight against ISK? There are different tribes, there are different regions, there are a lot of divisions within Afghanistan, and those connections give the Taliban tremendous local knowledge. So they often know leaders and communities, they often know individuals, and that knowledge is vital for counterinsurgency. And that was something that always bedeviled the Afghan government or US forces. But there are certain tribes in certain areas where the Taliban are less popular, or at times outright unpopular. And those areas are ones where ISK is drawing more support. ISK is affiliated with the wider terror network. So does that mean that the Taliban would require international help to crush it? So the wider terror network that ISK is part of is much weaker than it was in 2015 when ISK emerged. 
And ISK may draw some legitimacy from the movement, but its ability to draw on money and weapons and fighters is greatly diminished. So part of the job of the international community is to keep that broader movement weak. Remember, that's the same international community which refuses to recognize the Taliban as a legitimate government. It's a strange predicament. So the presence of ISK has been something of a unifying factor in the international response. There is a recognition that as bad as the Taliban is, that there are worse elements out there. There are ones that are even more brutal, and there are ones that also want to do attacks, whether it's international targets in Afghanistan or attack other countries. That said, the Taliban's own record has been a limiting factor. Countries are certainly opposed to ISK, but they're reluctant to move too closely to the Taliban. It's also a major problem for the Taliban's nationalist agenda to be seen to be relying on outside help again. When it was fighting the United States and the Afghan government, it criticized the Afghan government for being dependent on foreign powers. And so if the Taliban showed a similar dependence, that would further reduce its legitimacy. However, it could do quiet cooperation. It could do things behind the scenes that would at least give it some information and some greater ability to fight ISK. We don't know for sure what's happening behind the scenes, but it could be that the wider threat posed by ISK might have initiated some sort of indirect cooperation, including from a familiar source. So it's possible there's still intelligence collection. The Biden administration made clear that it was trying to secure America by having international intelligence collection and being able to strike around the world if necessary. The killing last year of al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in Kabul is, is one example where the U.S. showed it had the ability to act. And although the United States it doesn't have a network on the ground after the withdrawal of U.S. forces, the U.S. does have other intelligence assets. And information from that could be shared directly, but more likely it would go through other countries. Uh, Pakistan seems like an obvious conduit where information could be shared, knowing that it would be shared from Pakistan to the Taliban to take out groups like ISK. I think it's very difficult for ISK to advance, and it may even suffer significant defeats. The ISK message has not resonated widely. It's difficult for any government to control Afghanistan, so I don't think the Taliban control will be complete. But I think it's quite possible that in the medium term, the Taliban will have greater control over more of Afghanistan and ISK will be further diminished. So can the Taliban fix its terror problem? There are too many differences for peace talks or power sharing to be feasible. ISK is nowhere near the scale of the Taliban insurgency that raged for decades against various Afghan governments. But security isn't the only thing it threatens. It's taking aim at the Taliban by persistently challenging its religious credentials. Even if ISK was diminished, other problems remain, like poverty, hunger and the suppression of human rights. This edition of The Inquiry was presented by me, Charmaine Cozier, and produced by Christopher Blake. The research was John Cosset, editor Tara McDermott, and technical producer Kelly Young. From the BBC World Service and CBC Podcasts, the longest part of a scam is really the grooming process. I keep thinking so much about you. I miss you so badly. She was trying to get me to send her money. Initially it was for a broken phone, fixing something in a car. Love, Janessa, the true crime podcast exploring how one woman's stolen images are being used by criminals as bait to target people looking for love online. She has to be one of the most catfished images. Really anyone can fall for this, right? There's no one type of victim. I think he sent her close to $5,000. Oh my God! She said, if you really loved me, you do what I asked you to do. And then you responded. You used a fake identity, a false story, and stolen photographs. Why should I give you anything at all? Join Hannah Ajala as she goes in search of the woman whose face has unwittingly launched countless romance scams. It's a story about love, deceit, and survival, and it's available now. Search for Love Janessa wherever you found this podcast.